Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast. This is Bruce Hutchin, host and executive producer. Each week, you will hear tips, techniques, strategies, and personal stories from some of the best and funniest whitetail hunters in North America. Hope you enjoy today's episode. If you do, tell a friend on social media. If not, tell me and I'll make it better. Thanks for listening, folks. This is Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast, episode number 390. Hey folks, we got a new sponsor. It's called Buckwild Coffee. What's so special about Buckwild Coffee? Well, a gazillion people go to Starbucks every day and drink coffee. Well, why shouldn't Buckwild Coffee offer you light, medium, or dark roast with free shipping? All you have to do is go to whitetailrendezvous.com, go to shop, and order your coffee. And I'll ship it out for free. Hey, thanks so much for visiting Buckwild Coffee. The best brew in the West, the best brew around the campfire, the best brew in the hunting shack, the best brew anywhere. Buckwild Coffee. Get yours today. Oh. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Roundabout. We're heading down to the Carolinas, and we're going to chat with John Criminger. Now, John is the author, owner, and pretty much uh, camp host at Roadkill Art. What does Roadkill Art have to have? Or what is it all about? Well, you're going to have to listen to your show to find out. But if you're if you're in a bad mood today, boy, this is the perfect show for you because he's going to have you rolling and crying and the stories he's going to tell because they've been hunting the same land for many generations. So we welcome John Criminger from Road Kill Art. And we're heading down to the Carolinas, South Carolina to be exact, kind of around, sort of, kind of, by Columbia, South Carolina. We're going to meet with Mr. Roadkill Art himself. Now, you folks better listen because John Criminger has some wild stories that he's going to share today, and he's going to give you the background on Roadkill Art. John, welcome to the show. Hey, Bruce, how you doing? It's good to be here. I'm uh, I'm excited about talking about talking with you and talking about what's going on in my world down here. Maybe well, I can share some stuff with y'all and let you see what's going on. Well, yeah, and you got some crazy world. That's that's for Dagon, sure. And we talked a couple of weeks ago and got ready for the show. And so let's start right off uh, and 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 let folks know what the heck roadkill art is all about. Roadkill art is uh, I, I tell you how it got started. I, I'm, I'm a taxidermist. That's what I do, and I do deer processing. I was up at the shop one day just doing some work, and around about lunch time. Uh, I noticed two ladies walking up my driveway and, uh, it was a producer from, uh, and her name was Janet. She came up and, uh, and started asking me questions about my life, how I live, what I do. Uh, there's a lot of tax terms out there. Some of them don't hunt, some of them don't fish, some of them do. And she was looking for a tax in South Carolina that, uh, they lived outdoors. Uh, the family lived outdoors, the family hunted, the kids hunted, and that's what we do. And uh, so I just handed her my phone. I said, look at the pictures on there and see if that tells you anything. And she looked at the pictures, and it was nothing but hunting and fishing. And and that's all that's on there. And I opened my freezer up and said, look, this is what we eat. So I opened this big freezer up I got out here in the house. And uh, there's nothing but deer meat in this thing and ducks and fish. So she was pretty, pretty excited about that. And that's how I got started. So the show is about a South Carolina taxidermist that lives off the outdoors. And the whole family hunts and fishes and does, you know, the outdoor thing. So this is not something that we just started. They come up and said, hey, we're going to film you and act like you're a hunter or a fisherman. This is real life stuff. This is what we do. And this is how we live. This is what I grew grew up doing. I mean, this is, (laughs) I really don't know nothing else but the outdoors and (laughs) and hunting and fishing and and putting people's mouths together and saving the memories and, and even taking picture on, uh, t- taking people on, uh, fishing trips and hunting trips and, 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 uh, and sharing the experience of the outdoors with them. And that's what's important right there. Well, this fine lady, Janet, now why'd she stop by your place? I don't know. I think she had a flat tire out there. I believe it was, or, or a rabbit or something run out in front of us from off the road. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding with you. Uh, uh, she had went, uh, I was a member of the uh, Sakalata Taxidermy Association. So she went around looking for that right taxidermist. 
for that right person. So she goes on these lists of people for South Carolina, North Carolina, all these different states of tax, taxidermists. And she went to these people and uh, interviewed them and talked to them and, and found out, you know, how they lived and, and what they did. And so she went through a few before she did, before she got to me. But that's how she found me on the South Carolina uh, Association of Taxidermists. And uh, she got my name and got my number and, and called me and then showed up at my door. And, it, and it's been going since then. How long have you been doing this? Uh, this is probably about a year, year and a, year and a half or so now, I believe it is. No, is she like <clears throat> the executive producer, Roadkill Art? Is that what she does? Yep. Mm-hmm. That's what she does. That's what she does. She's trying to take it to another level. And we're working our way up the ladder. We got a lot of viewers. We got a lot of fans. Uh, it's done got to where, uh, I mean, people don't got to know me so well around here. I mean, I, 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 if I go to the grocery store in three towns that we got around here, somebody's going to walk up to me and ask me, are we still filming? Are we still shooting? Or oh, I seen you in that video the other day acting crazy. You know, that, that somebody's going to know me from Roadkill Art. Yeah, and I always like to say during our show, folks, that we're going to have a lot of fun today, but it's real people in real places, and that's what makes uh, Whitetail Rendezvous unique. And before we go on, tell people how they get a hold of you, uh, John. Uh, if they want to get a hold of me, any kind of questions, anything about hunting, fishing, whatever they want to ask me, uh, you can reach me on the Facebook site, Road Kill Art. Just like it sounds, Road Kill Art on Facebook. Go there, ask any questions you want. We respond pretty quickly, and uh, and uh, we got some numbers on there also, and and uh, uh, you can get a hold of me through Roadkill Art. Now I get the art part because people, I've got a couple mounts, and people like to see mounts, but what does it mean to you to be a taxidermist? Because really, you're creating memories, and we talked about that before. So let's kind of deep dive into, you know what you do, what you do, and the memories you create that last heck years. Well, uh, it, it's, it's an experience. I mean, you meet a lot of different people, uh, you know, uh, you know, just, I mean, if you hunted and then you hunted all your life, or even if you started hunting last year, uh, you got a certain group of people that you hang with, that you hunt with, that you fish with. But when you're in my kind of business, man, you meet them all, you know, you, <laughs> I got you wouldn't believe that the stories that come up that come through here that people tell me of how they killed this deer or, or you know, how they, uh, uh, how the wife killed this deer or how the kid killed the first deer. And, uh, so that's pretty exciting to hear all that and see all that. And, uh, and they'd be able to put that, uh, rack in my hands and, and take it in and say, okay, we're going to take care of it. And we're going to turn it into something you can put on your wall and, and, and make art out of it. I mean, that's, that's pretty much what the taxidermist does. He, you know, it's, it's uh it's it's just a it's a it's an exciting job it's fun to do and if you love the outdoors and you love doing uh uh things with your family and hearing all the different stories then taxidermy is the way to go i mean it's a good job to have it's it's uh it's, 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 it's there's never a dull moment i can guarantee you that well from last season what's kind of a um, couple of humorous stories that came down your driveway uh well let's see i uh, let me think. I had a good one the other day. I'm trying to remember what what the heck that one was. But uh, I had a guy. Uh, I had a guy brought a huge buck in. He was an eight point, but he was huge. He was an old deer, had good mass all the way out to the tips on, on the horns. And uh, uh, he had killed that thing on the deer drive. But he was telling me how they had let the dogs out on that thing, and uh, the dogs was running because they do a lot of dog running. You know, down here, I don't know you know what to do up there but we do a lot of dog running there they do i don't do i don't do much dog hunting but anyway uh they was out letting them dogs out and had some standards standing out down there so this guy's got the dogs and he goes down the road in his truck he's sitting there and they down there the dogs are hooting and howling and they running some deer down through there and he's sitting on the back of his truck on this chair they got uh screwed on top of the toolbox there and uh so he's sitting there smoking him a cigarette <laughs> Didn't even have his gun out, and I had his gun in the truck while he was sitting there. So he just got out first drive that did. Said he looked down the road, and there stood that big buck with his tongue hanging out, standing down there looking at him in the road. Said he jumped off that dog on the truck, got tangled up on some stuff he had, fell off the side of the truck on his back, jumped up, looked, the deer still standing there looking at him, opened the door, 
gets his gun out and shoots the deer and kills him. Now, you tell me that ain't a uh, a way to kill the big one right there. That's a story he can tell his kids and, 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 and his grandkids. <laughs> Man, that deer committed suicide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think he... I think uh, I think he told me that he thought that deer run out there was asking for him to shoot him. <laughs> I were, I've had a lot of deer look at me, and I was either indisposed or not ready, and he just kind of smiled and said, walks off and said, that's it. Yeah, him. right. I, I didn't have a pose for me. Say, come and yeah, get big yeah, boy. Yeah, he said, man, he said he just stood there just pretty as you ever seen. Well, did he, did he let yeah. you mount it? Yeah, I got him. I got him. I got him in the shop up there. When he shot him, you know, when they do them drives and all, they shoot, uh, they shoot, uh, uh buckshot shotgun. Right. And uh, he he knocked one of the G2s. He broke it off, knocked the big chunk out of the right side of the horn on the main beam. He did some damage to it. He said he was pretty shook up when he shot. You know, especially after tumbling out of the truck and, doing, and going through all that that he had to do to get the gun up there to shoot him. You know. <laughs> well, folks. <laughs> <laughs> somebody else has probably got a similar story but i haven't heard it yet so tell me tell me about the hunting tradition i mean you guys are hunting fools i get that uh you love the hunt that's part of your that's just part of who you are so let's go back a few years and let's talk about how how john got started in this whole outdoor affair well i it's it's something i was born and raised in i mean uh you know, when I was a kid growing up, I had two brothers. I'm the youngest one. And uh, <clears throat> they never, you know, mom and daddy, they didn't. When we went on vacation, they didn't go to the beach and lay on the beach or to the mountains to hang out looking out across the cliff, you know, and, and just looking at the leaves changing colors. Uh, we went fishing or we went hunting. If we went, if we had the tent in the truck, we were going camping somewhere where we could catch a big fish or shoot a big deer or even a little deer just to put some food in the, in the freezer, you know. And that's what we did. So when you're born and raised uh, in, in, in like that, I mean, that's that's what you do. There's a lot of hunters that come up here I talk to, and they just started last year. Or they've been hunting for 10 years. And, you know, and uh, and those, those are, uh, I don't know, they're, they're uh, when I'm talking to them, if I can see the difference in a hunter that is hunted five years between a hunter that has hunted all his life. You know, there's a difference. There's a different kind of excitement. There's a different kind of talk. There's a different kind of everything that comes out of them, you know. But when you've been doing it all your life, this is what I know. This is what I do. And uh, my whole family does it. My wife hunts. My kids hunt. Uh, I mean, we all we all do it. We all love it. Uh, when my wife met me, she didn't deer hunt. I started her hunting. And now... She can't wait for deer season to come in every year. She got to go. But we've made it talking about traditions. We've we've kind of got a tradition here uh, to where, and we did it when I was a kid too. You know, before deer season comes in, man, we all get up, we get family up, and we get out and and we we cleaning out deer stands. We knocking down wolf nests. We dragging the snakes out of the deer stands down in the swamp. You know, whatever we got to do to get everything ready, we make that a weekend deal. And that's something that I believe in doing with the family because that keeps them motivated. That keeps them going. That keeps them into it, you know. So we get them out there and, and, and do this stuff with them, and it gets them jacked up, man. They waiting for deer season to come in. They ready for it to come in, ready to get out there and shoot something, you know. But uh, after we get done doing that, we come back to the house, man. We'll have something to put on the grill. We'll cook, sit back. And because of us being out all day doing the deer stand work and doing – and being out in the outdoors, getting ready for deer season, all the stories come out from last year. Everybody wants to talk about how Daddy missed a big bug or how, uh, you know, Brother Mike uh, uh, fell out of deer stand. You know, <laughs> you know, somebody's got something to talk about and laugh about. So we, we, we kind of made that a tradition. It's been going on for a long time, and, and we seem to enjoy it. It gets everybody pumped up and gets them ready to go, especially the newcomers in the hunting world and their family, like the kids and stuff. It, Get some excited and get some going. So that's that's pretty much a a tradition we got going on around here. You know, you talk about you know years and years and years, and it really is a family affair for you folks and and millions of other folks. It just 
brings family closer together. You think about the stories, uh, sitting around the campfire, sitting around the kitchen table, sitting around the picnic bench, and and just sharing um, the hunting tradition. And and I thank you for that because the stories keep the whole thing going. The stories have been passed down from great grandfather to grandfather to the father, and then the son, and then it keeps rolling on. And you know, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's over a hundred years right there. <clears throat> Go back to great great grandfather, yeah. and so yeah, yeah. you know. The other thing I find interesting about you, you don't just do the taxidermy. When you when you get a hog in or 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 a deer or whatever you guys get, um, you fix it up. So what's what's one of your favorite uh, venison recipes? Uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, we do a lot for the customers around here. We got a, a we got a, a, a bacon burger that we do. Man, they love it. It's real good. Uh, my favorite one is. Uh, I like to take the tenderloins, the, the inner loins, the little short ones that are on the inside. Man, I like to marinate, marinate those things in some Italian dressing and Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> I about got tongue-tied on saying that. Italian dressing and Worcestershire sauce. And you put uh, you put your uh, Italian dressing in a Ziploc bag, and every how much meat you got of how much dressing you need to cover that, you put half of the Worcestershire sauce. So, every how much Italian dressing, put uh, half of the Worcestershire sauce. So, if you got a cup of Italian dressing, then you put uh, a half a cup of Worcestershire sauce, if I'm making any sense to you. Yes, sir. And you take that, man, cut you up a, cut you up a good onion and put it in there with it. And take those tenderloins. I like to cut them up in, uh, in some little chunks before I marinate them. Cut them up. Get them put in the marinade. Shake them up real good. You can put you some pepper, salt, any kind of seasoning, creole, whatever you want to put on it. Put it in the refrigerator marinate it for two days. And two days is the thing. Two days? Take it out. Two days. Take it out. Put it on some skewer sticks with some onions, bell peppers, uh, mushrooms, uh, tomatoes, uh, you know, whatever you want to put on it. And wrap them in some bacon and put them things on the grill. And just you ain't got to cook them but just a little bit on each side till the bacon is done. And, man, them things will melt in your mouth. And has, and then the flavor is just off the chain. I mean, it's, it'll be excellent. Man, I'm... I'm- my mouth salivating just like that. Now, what kind of beer do you like to drink with that? Or you drink sweet tea or you drink that other stuff? No, that you no, the holler? no, no, we get out of here. When we get out of here, I got to, when we hit, when we built this house out here, we, I told, I said, I want a back porch on this thing. Cause I can overlook the swamp down here where we hunt at. I said, I want a back porch on this thing as long as the house. And I built one and we got a little cookout spot out here behind the, uh, the, the, down here off the bottom deck right here, man. We get out there and cook, son, and we'll drink some of them BLs, we call them right here, which is a Bud Light, you know. And uh, we have a good time, man. We sit out here and talk, shoot skeets right off the deck. And, man, well, it, hey, ain't no dull moment. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you charge folks to come out and eat and, and, and uh, let them re- you, let you regale them in uh, a comic um Comic relief? <laughs> no, no, but I should. I should. <laughs> we have a good time. I ain't lying. We have a ball. Every now and again, we'll have a. Uh, we'll get a little trailer out here. We'll shoot. We'll set a little band up or something, bluegrass or some old country music or something. She will have a good time out here. I guess you would. <laughs> ain't nothing wrong with having good times. Oh no, <laughs> that's for sure. No, no. You do you hunt with shotguns? now or do you use rifles or bows we we bow and rifle we have both season rifle season uh where i was uh the, the next county over uh where i was actually born and raised it we actually had a muzzleloader season but we don't have that over here in this county uh but we, we got uh but you can hunt with a shotgun if you want to but it's just mostly most people hunt with a rifle and then we got the bow hunters that hunt during both season the, you know the hardcore bow hunters you know they'll they'll uh hunt a pretty good bit during both seasons. Our bow season is so warm around here. It gets so hot now during both seasons. Uh, it pretty much weeds out the ones that, you know, likes to sit on the couch a lot, you know, and talk about hunting. And then the ones that are really dedicated and into it, they'll be the ones out there bringing the deers in with the boat, you know. Yeah, let's, let's talk about, you told me an interesting story about uh, a gentleman that came up up the drive and he was pretty all rigged out and he had everything possibly that a guy could need to, to kill a deer. And, uh, tell us that story. Yeah. 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 We, we, we got a few of them that comes up here. 
But uh, uh, yeah, hey, we I had one. I think it was last year. He come up here. He just he he's a new hunter. You know, hadn't been doing a whole whole long you know a, a real long time. And but he's one of those that's got all the right stuff. I mean, he's got the right uh uh, uh clothes. He's got the right shoes. Uh, he's got the nice backpack, man. I mean, he's got it all. You know, and uh. But uh, if I'm thinking about the one, you, if, uh, if I'm thinking on the right one, because I got so many people to come up here, it's hard to keep up with all of them. But uh, this particular guy, he had been hunting this deer. He'd been hunting a big deer, and uh, he finally got him. But he come up here, man, he was so shook up, he couldn't hardly talk, man. He was excited about killing that big deer. And the big deer that he killed was a big deer that them guys been hunting on the cutting club. They actually let that guy in. They like to let those guys in that don't hunt a whole lot because they don't think they're going to kill the big deer. But this guy actually killed the biggest deer they was hunting that on that hunt club that they got. So they was kind of a little, you know, didn't really like it too much. But he was excited. Now, he was shook up. He was, yeah, he was, he was thrilled to death. But he, he was. Yeah, he was, he was one of them that, that you know, what I call the, uh, the magazine hunters, if, if you know what I'm talking about. They're the ones that, you know, sit around and read all the stories in the magazine and go buy all the high-tech stuff, you know, and getting out there trying to hunt and been hunting six months to a year, you know. But that's great, man. We love them. We like all kinds. That's what makes the hunting. That's what makes the stories, and that's what puts us all together in the outdoor world. It takes all kinds. It takes all of us. You know. Whitetail Rondo is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draw odds are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to gohunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for gohunt.com gear shop. All in all, if you're hunting out west in 2018, gohunt.com insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. To make it happen. Yeah, and that, that's so true. And um, we talked about common ground and everything. And, you know, the joy he had because he harvested, you know, a, a great buck. But then he came to you and said, you know, I want you to, you know, fix this up. So he's going to have that in his office or his den or in his garage or where yeah. he's going to put it. But you know, you're yep. part of that. That's, that's the intriguing thing I think about taxidermy because we, we entrust our, our trophies. What size doesn't matter because it's a trophy, whether it's a, you know, a bluegill or a big moose it really doesn't matter yeah. because um, taxidermists keep that uh, art again for us. They, they create art and, and if you've seen some of the big um, big trophy rooms, the guys have pictures of them and and stuff, and they can sit down and their eyes get glassy when they look over that crocodile or that raccoon or that. Um, oh, I'm I'm thinking, um, you know, one of the big fives of the yep. buffalo or something like that, or or that um, yeah, or that a rabbit, you know the first snowshoe rabbit they killed or jackrabbit they killed with their 22 and they're all, they all tell a story. And it's just like, I love having guys like you on because you're telling stories by your work. And I, I think that's, that's really admirable uh, myself. I don't know what their listeners think. Listeners, if you, if you kind of resonate with that, just, uh, you know, send me a email to www. uh, Not, that this whitetail rendezvous at gmail.com let me know your thoughts because um we're we're talking today about making memories and roadkill art and then john down there in the carolinas he's just sharing stories and let's talk about hey, um, hey, yeah, hey, go ahead. hey let me tell you let me tell you let me tell you this one real quick talking about me being a tax nervous amount and stuff and all I got a deer hanging in my in my shop up there in my in my showroom I got up there. And everybody that comes through that door, that's the first deer they see. That's the first deer they look at. Yeah. And it's not because it's hanging straight across them when they come in. It's because he he's a big deer. I mean right. this he this thing's a monster. Is he a pig? And my is he a swamp donkey? Swamp donkey? Uh, he, yeah. 
yeah, 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 yeah. He he he's a he's a hoax. My daddy killed that deer. Yeah. And this is what this is that you were talking about me being tax dermis and the members. Well, <laughs> this is the one I don't like to talk about. Because everybody comes in the door and wants to know who killed that deer. Well, my daddy killed that deer. My daddy killed that deer out of my deer stand. No. Back when I was in high school, uh, I had found a place on the creek, and a deer had it rubbed. And we killed decent deer. We didn't really never kill no big deer nowhere in that neighborhood down there anywhere, you know. And, uh, well, I found this place on the creek down there, and there was an oak tree down there big around as your leg rubbed. And I said, man, that's got to be a big deer right there. But he had it rough for three years straight. And I finally got went down there, and I got me a stand right on the creek, right on the rub. I had some stands down the creek everywhere. Never seen this deer. Christmas break, I was out for the whole week. I hunted that deer stand Monday to Friday, morning and evening, and never seen a deer out of it. Friday evening, Daddy gets home from work. He says, where are you hunting at in the morning? Saturday morning. I said, I'm going to hunt another stand that we put up on down the creek down there. I said, I'm going to hunt it. He said, I done told you, if you're going to kill that big deer, you got to be in that deer stand. I said, well, I've hunted it all week, Daddy. I'm going to go down there and hunt down the creek down there and hunt that other one. He said, well, if you ain't going to hunt it, can I hunt it? I said, yeah, go hunt it. He goes down there and I hear him shooting about, I don't know, 8.30 or something that morning. Unloaded a 30 off 6 on him. And, uh, uh, man, this thing, he was saying, he, he's a, he's a big deer, but everybody, man, Hey, I'm proud of my daddy for killing that deer. I had got all my life to kill a big deer like that. My daddy's 70 something years old. He's still out there hunting. He gets out there, fish his camps with us and tracking deer through the woods and everything. But, uh, everybody that comes in that shop sees that deer. And I got to tell that story of my daddy shooting that deer out of my deer stand. Okay, so why did Mr. Wonderful wait until you weren't there to show up? Now, figure that one out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's strange, ain't it? Never seen him. Never seen him. And back then, we didn't have all these deer cameras and all this stuff, you know, technology like we got now. So, uh, you know, it was pretty much go down, find your tracks, your trails, your scrubs, your rakes, uh, scrapes, and, and uh, you know, and that's how we hunted. And uh, so we never seen the deer. Never knew he was down there other than that big tree being rubbed. And I knew there was a big one in there, but I just didn't know it was that big, you know. Isn't that something? But I lost some sleep over that one. Yeah, I lost some sleep over it. <laughs> so what's one of the funniest things that happened that, that's happened to you, um, either gigging frogs or chasing hogs or, 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 or you know, hunting whitetails? What's one of your famous, your famous stories when everybody's sitting around and you're in the B.O. in a mood and, and you're all uh, full up and you're just sitting there and the Crickets are cricking and the, the flies are yeah. buzzing. <clears throat> I, 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 we used to have some game management land we hunted up the river, so we'd have to put the boat in a lot and go up the river and hunt. There was two boats of us. There was me and my boat and my brother, one of my brothers in my boat. And then my other brother, one of our good buddies, was in the other boat. We'd been up the river hunting all morning. we come down the river, both boats of us, and uh, we got at the boat ramp. Uh, buddy got out, went up, crunk his truck up, and backed up trailer down in the water well my brother was in his boat driving he's gonna drive it up on the trailer he drives it up on the trailer lit him a cigarette put it in his mouth stuck his finger up in the air and he pointed and said go ahead and the boat ramp was pretty steep well he got on the gas and started that old big f-150 four by four jacked up he got on the gas he did been long bought that thing he was proud of it. he got on the gas and them old pipes got to talking and he went up that boat ramp and my brother was hollering, whoa, whoa, whoa. But he couldn't hear him because the truck was so loud with them pipes he had on it. And he went up that ramp. And the trailer, they didn't latch the latch on the front of it. So as he was going up the ramp, the boat is sliding back off the boat, off the trailer. They didn't come all the way out of the water. And it gets off balance. And the boat hits the boat ramp. All I seen was my brother's cigarette fly up in the air. And then the front went down, landed on the boat ramp, and he just kept right on driving up the boat ramp, up, up where you load up at. Ooh, but you talking about funny. That was funny. <clears throat> and he stepped out of that boat on the boat ramp, and there was a woman on the bank over there fishing. And she was dialing the number and on the phone, and you could hear over there, you ain't going to believe what I just seen. And she was laughing. Her brother steps out of the boat, and his face is just red as it can be. Standing on the boat ramp, and they're setting the boat all the way out of the water, and he done pulled up there getting out of the truck wondering where the boat was at. That was that was that was pretty hilarious there. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You know, what do you what do you tell your kids when you know everybody in South Carolina 
you know, knows NASCAR and knows hunting and knows something about dogs and everything. But some of the kids, especially around Columbia, they could care less about hunting or hunting tradition. What do you tell their kids when somebody says you hunt? And it's not a positive you hunt. It's like, what's wrong with you? What do, uh, what, what, what do you do tell the kids? We tell the, yeah. What do you tell the kids? To tell uh, them? The, the, uh, my kids to tell them. Yeah. That's what you're asking me. Yeah. Oh, my kids, it just comes natural to them. It's, I mean, they just, my kids are raised just like I was raised. I mean, <laughs> they've been, uh, out running around in the woods since I had diapers on, you know, and, uh, uh, I mean, it's just, it, it just comes natural to them. It's like, you know, they, they just, you know, you don't hunt, you know, who don't hunt? You know, that's the way they, that's the way my little boy looks at it. He's like, they don't hunt, daddy, why? I mean, they, he just thinks everybody hunts, you know, because that's just what we do around here. You know, it's just so much between the taxidermy, the processing, and all the hunting and fishing we do. He just thinks that's a natural thing. And, uh, so he's just, it's, it's just, you know, <laughs> it's, he just, he just don't. He don't know how to talk to him. I don't reckon about, you know, but as he's getting older, then he'll see that, you know, he'll he'll, he'll meet his buddies just like I did where he'll have them starting to hunt, starting to fish. I got so many buddies through the years that, that, uh, that didn't hunt, didn't fish and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, they like to drink and do a lot of things and hang out at bars and I get them into hunting and fishing and now they got boats, they got a family, they got a life, they don't hang out at the bars no more. And, uh, and it just changed their life. And, and that's, that's a good thing about the great outdoors is if you raise your kids to live off the land, even though they ain't got to, they can go up to a grocery store and buy the stuff that you don't even know what somebody's injected in it or put in it or how it was raised, you know, but, uh, uh, it's good to raise your kids uh, in the outdoors. I mean, it's, if they may grow up and be doctors and lawyers and never have to go out and feel nothing. If they didn't want to, they can buy anything they want to. But if you raise them in the outdoors and teach them the right things, teach them the right way of life, teach them, teach them what God has given, uh, has put on this earth for us to enjoy and have and to feed us and to grow us and to make us live. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty important to them. And if they learn that, it makes them, I believe it makes them a better person in life. It makes them respect the outdoors. It makes them respect people. It makes them respect animals. It makes them, uh, uh, you know, it's it just, it's an awesome thing. Yeah, I'm just sitting back and that, that the last couple of minutes, it was a great summary of what thousands of people listen to my show think. And, and John, thanks for um, bringing that out and sharing that because folks, um, John understands the hunting tradition. Can we all live like John? Can we live in the places? Can we do that? No, but just know that when you show up his place, then it's all good. You know, it really is all good. That's right. And that's right. We all come, we all come from different places, but hunting just, um, it brings us together. I, I think that's the easiest thing to say. It just brings us together. And because of that, yep. um, we're, we're better people. Now, if, if you're somebody that doesn't believe in that, that's fine. Send me an email. Tell me why you don't believe in it. But other than that, um, it's, it's all special. And, and I just think, I just think that's marvelous that you could share and articulate that. You know, when you, when you think about hunting whitetails in South Carolina, how do you guys hunt them? Is it any different than we hunt them in, in, in the Midwest or, you know, how do you, how do you actually hunt them? <clears throat> well, I, I've never been out that way and hunted. I've never had the opportunity to do it. <laughs> Maybe one day, uh, I'll have that opportunity, but, uh, out here, this is, this is, I, I've never hunted anywhere else. This is the only place I've ever hunted. You know, I grew up, for, uh, and we, when we hunted, we hunted, put food on our table, caught fish, put, you know, food on the table, whatever we, we did. But, uh, uh, but hunting out here is, uh, we got a lot of woods. We got a lot of, uh, in, in, the, in, in the part of the uh, South Carolina, I mean, we got a lot of sand. We got a lot of blackjacks. Uh, and and uh, they, they're pretty much coming in and wiping out all the oaks. I mean, it's pretty much pine trees. Uh, we used to have a lot of pretty uh, hollows and, and, uh, and, and valleys and, and just full of oak trees. But, but they're, they're starting to, to fade away. And uh, But it's. So we're, we're really trying to, we're really actually having to change our hunting styles. Used to, we could go out in these hollers and, 
find these big oak hollers with the acorns dropping and get on the acorn trees and the trails and hunt and, and kill deer. But uh, with all the pines coming in, and I mean, it's, it's a whole different thing now. Now you deer, the deer, don't, the deer don't have anything to eat in the pine, but they're just traveling through it. So you have to get out there and do your food plots and do your, uh, uh, you know, uh, put your food source in to try to hold some deer on your land or at least get them while they're coming through your land to come through a place where you can have the opportunity to take one, you know. So it's, uh, it's, it's got pretty interesting around here within the past 10, 15 years with all the, uh, uh, with all the timber being cut and the pine trees, but it's so it's uh, we, uh, to be honest with you, we're kind of I mean we're kind of uh, it's almost feels like we're starting over again and hunting and learning it, but uh, it takes some figuring out. But once you figure it out and get you a good clear cut or somewhere to hunt, figure out where your deer is walking, uh, set you up a stand and uh, and hunt it and look for your signs, your rubs, your scrapes, your trails where they're crossing the creeks and your bedding areas and and uh, hunt around them. On the property that I hunt on out here, and one of my daughter's stands uh, is one of the best stands we have out here. There's a big thicket down in the bottom, and this thing is thick. It has got trees, uh, old trees just laying in there all on the ground. So it's a, it's a great bedding area for the deer. They love it. There's water source runs through there, and they just they bed all in there. But we never go in there unless we have to go in there to track a deer to get a deer out. We just got stands around it, and my daughter's stand, we got it on a hill with a little shooting lane cuts that goes down to the edge of the uh, the thicket there where they lay at. And the thicket is probably not, but uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, an acre and a half or something like that. But uh, we just hunt around it, man. And them deer come out of that thing and, and uh, they go move around in the evenings and come around the edge of it. And, and it's just almost every time she hunts that she'll sit there and watch. She just she just go up there and sit and watch deer. She can just kind of pick one if she wants to shoot it. Or she's getting where now she likes to let them walk and, and uh, she's she's wanting to kill a real big one, so she'll let them walk and, and uh, hoping on the big one to come out and come home and tell some stories about what she's seen and how they was acting and what they was doing, you know. But uh, a lot of dog driving, or it used to be, they kind of cut it back a little bit, but there's still a lot of that going on. Uh, but it's starting to, uh, they actually had a bill up to pass a law where they was trying to end the, uh, the dog hunt around here uh, just because of uh, a property uh, problems with, you know, people that there's so many people that still hunt here. They really, they don't like the dogs coming on their land. And there's a lot of dog hunters here that lets the dog, that well, they don't let them, the dogs going to do what they're going to do. So, you know, they just go over there and get them, don't ask permission. And then they end up shooting the deer on the guy's land while they're over there retrieving their dogs and causes a lot of problems. So they're trying to end it. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's mostly still hunting and thickets and pines and, uh, clear cuts is, is what we got out here. You know, just thinking, you know, how we have to adapt to what happens in our terrain. It, it could be a tornado coming through. It could be a fire coming through. It could be a blight coming through. And, and you know, the hardwoods are taken out and they're coming in with, you know, with uh, trees that grow a heck of a lot faster than an oak tree. And it's commercial. But it's interesting as you have to, as a deer have to adapt to the terrain and the food sources, then you have to adapt to where they're going to be because that place that Uncle Bob, had killed a deer 10 years in a row doesn't exist anymore. That's right. That's right. Just doesn't exist anymore. So we have to be very adaptive to that. And yeah. how many acres do you have down there? I got about 200, right at 200 out here that, that, uh, that we, that we hunt on here. Just, just my family. Uh, and, uh, there's, uh, there's all kind of public land around here to hunt on. Uh, we don't hunt it a lot. I, I, I turkey hunted a little bit, but not, not as much as I used to. Uh, but we got 200 acres here, and uh, we, I got a swamp in the back. When I bought this property, uh, 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 I, I bought it because it had the swamp. Like we got ducks, and I was looking out for my kids growing up because I want them to be, you know, raised in the outdoors. So we got ducks, we got wild hogs, we got deer, we got turkeys, uh, squirrels, foxes, bobcat, you know, whatever. You know, they want to hunt, they can hunt it out here, and that's why I bought this property. We don't have to go anywhere if we don't want to. Used to, we had to travel and go here, go there to hunt, and, and uh, I were to, to get on a piece of property. I had permission to hunt, but since I was fortunate enough to, to get the property that I have now, we can do everything right here. We can get up in the morning, fix us some breakfast, and uh, take our time, and then go out the doors and want to go one way and the other go the other way. 
Now, what's the closest you've shot a, a, a buck or a doe? It doesn't matter. How close to the um, to the house have you killed a deer? Oh, well, I, I, since I started doing the deer processing, I don't get to hunt as much as I used to. So uh, I told my wife, I said, she said, what you going to do? You, you, like, you love to hunt and you hunt all the time and that's going to cut you back on your hunt. And I said, well, I got to do something. <laughs> so I went out behind the shop probably... Uh, it, it it can't be no more than 60 feet. And I put me a little ground line on the ground that, in, in the woods right there. Cut me a shooting lane down through there. And, man, I kill, uh, I kill a lot of deer right there. My wife, I can sit there and hunt, and if somebody pulls up at the shop, I'm right there. I just get up and walk out. And then if they drop something off or whatever, I can just ease right back in the stand. And I've done that many a times and killed deer. And uh, so it, 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 works out, it works out pretty good for me. So, you can can you answer your phone from your deer stand? No, I can't answer the phone, but I'm working on that. Sir. <laughs> I'm working on that. <laughs> Truth be told, I had some friends down in Texas, and I couldn't believe his his deer box. Anyway, and he had Wi-Fi. He had everything he needed. He he left his office for his office. I mean, he says I gotta go hunting, yeah. and I'm gonna keep working. And um, yeah, yeah. And so he he'd be set up working in his, in his deer box with his lazy boy or whatever. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, that ain't no different. Somebody going up here to uh to uh uh what's, what's the coffee place? Everybody goes Starbucks. You know, going up to yeah. Starbucks and taking yeah. their laptop. You go in there and it looks like everybody's at a desk and they're doing work. You know, <laughs> it's just their desk is out here in the middle of the woods. You know. <laughs> It's funny, folks. We're just kind of rambling on and hearing stories from from John and uh, Roadkill Art, and and uh, tell folks how to get a hold of you again, uh, John. All you got to do is go to Facebook, look up Roadkill Art, Roadkill Art on Facebook, and they can question me, ask me questions, see your pictures. Man, we got all kind of videos on there. I'm talking about frog gigging. And I ain't talking about gigging them little old bullfrogs now, them little toes you know, a lot of people won't call. I'm talking about some, uh, what we call swamp chickens around here. And these things are huge. So go on there and look at our videos. Check us out, man. Uh, like us on Facebook. Join the crew and, uh, and, and see what we got to offer. And we got a lot more coming, too. Well, that's just, I think that's just exciting. And, and you know, when you think about the hunting tradition, well, folks, uh, Go to Roadkill Art, and you're going to see, you know, what family uh, surrounded by the outdoors is all about. And, and with that, we're going to we're going to give uh, John a few minutes here to give some shout outs to all the people supporting him and his sponsors, if he has any, then his cousins, uncles, neighbors, and uh, whoever else is in his tribe down there. So, John, the mic's yours. <laughs> all right, thank you, Bruce. I appreciate that. <laughs> But, uh, hey, yeah, if y'all want to give us a, a look up, man, look us up on Facebook, see what we're all about. We're a family. Uh, we, we stick together. We hang together. We live the great outdoors. Uh, we laugh. We have fun. And uh, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's a way to keep the family together. And uh, it keeps everybody motivated and going. And uh, uh, so for, you know, everybody, Janet R. New, uh, she is uh, the producer of the show. Uh, and we're taking it. Uh, we, we've taken it to, to some new levels, uh, and I want to thank all my fans out there, too. i got a lot of fans out there that like to ask me questions on there and, and want me to do a video or show them how to catch a big uh, catfish or, or dig a big bullfrog. So y'all just keep watching this, and, uh, and we're gonna, we'll are gonna show you how to do it. If you don't know how to do it, we're going to show you how to do it. And uh, it might not be everybody's way, but I guarantee you we can show you how to put some fish in the boat, some frogs in the pot, or some uh, tenderloins from a big boat uh, in the frying pan. So y'all just hang out and keep an eye on us and uh, and see what happens. Well, with that, uh, Mr. Roadkill Art, it's been a pleasure, uh, John, to have you on the show. On behalf of thousands of listeners throughout North America, this was a hoot. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how it's going to work out, but when I'm when I'm blown and going and, and, and traveling, once uh, Whitetail Rendezvous gets uh, – it gets funded or it gets supported by folks and 
and uh, we make some money. Uh, I'm going to be on the road because, you know, I want to take, I want to take the show to you guys because um, you're the heart and soul of what we do here at Whitetail Ron. Yep. Have real people in real places. So, sir, thank you so much for being mm-hmm. a guest on Whitetail Rendezvous. Hey, I appreciate you having me, Bruce. And anytime, man, call us anytime, any questions. Anybody wants to know anything about South Carolina hunting, just let me know and we'll do what we can do. I appreciate talking on here. Uh, I hadn't got out y'all's way and done any hunting. Maybe- Hey, folks, we got a new sponsor. It's called Buckwild Coffee. What's so special about Buckwild Coffee? Well, a gazillion people go to Starbucks every day and drink coffee. Well, why shouldn't Buckwild Coffee offer you light, medium, or dark roast with free shipping? All you have to do is go to whitetailrendezvous.com, go to shop, and order your coffee, and I'll ship it out for free. Hey, thanks so much for visiting Buckwild Coffee. The best brew in the West, the best brew around the campfire, the best brew in the hunting shack, the best brew anywhere. Buckwild Coffee. Get yours today. Maybe one day I can get out that way and see what see what it's about out there. Hey, you're going to want to listen to the next episode of Whitetail Roundabout. We're going to head out to Idaho. We're going to connect with Steve Speck. Why are we heading to Idaho? Well, Steve owns XO Mountain Gear. And if you listen to a couple of shows ago, Matt Gray um, geared up, headed out to Colorado with a DIY license over the counter, and uh, he got a bull, and he and Steve got connected after that. And uh, Matt learned some of the ins and outs of backpacking for elk, and that's what this story's going to be about. This episode, Steve Speck's going to take it apart and tell you what it takes to backpack in the backcountry, DIY, with Rocky Mountain Elk. It's going to be a great show, folks. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.